three. Cue announcer. And starring the mad prophet of the airways. Jack. Wake up! All right, my guest today is Robbie Martin, his second time on the show. He's really just a great artist. He plays under a band called Fluorescent Gray. I think it's a one-man band. He also is one of the founders of Media Roots podcast and video producer, writer, editor, videographer. He's got a long history in music. He's got his own music label as well. And one of the reasons I had you on, Robbie, is I saw that piece that you did on RT on your sister's show. Your sister is Abby Martin. It's been in all the news recently. Before that happened, I booked you because I saw you playing a great mix live there on air. And I was just so impressed by that. And then you talking about uh, Freemasonic research. I thought it'd be cool to get you back on. But here you are in the middle of a giant poop storm. Robbie Martin, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Jack. <laughs> Describe it mildly. It's um, it's been pretty ridiculous. That's amazing that one little comment like that in the media can blow up to such a degree, isn't it? It is amazing, and I mean, right now the U.S. media seems so eager to start another Cold War that I mean, it, it was almost as if they used Abby's statement as a tool to just sort of manipulate it into their own propaganda to level against Russia, which was you know, yeah, it, kind of ridiculous on its face because. If you listen to Abby's entire statement, she criticizes America and Russia, you know, to simultaneously. So, actually. Yeah. <laughs> what I was going to say is, and for people out there that have been horrified by this, that, uh, I mean, an American, Abby Martin, would take kind of an American standpoint minimally, but more so an anti-war statement. You just haven't been following or listening to Abby all these years. And she is uh, somebody who really stays true to herself. And I, I bring this back to her being a, she's really a very good artist, as are you. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I wasn't able to sell out. I kind of have this artist thing going through me. And so, I mean, I kind of think that that's how I can give her the benefit of the doubt, even though I agree with her. I mean, I think that, that what she said was daring and bold, and but I, I do have to, in a sense, trust her that Putin himself didn't put her up to it. Oh, God, yeah. You know, what's, what's, what's hilarious to me is this, um, this guy, Jamie, I think Jamie Kerchick, who's going around parading around with Liz Wall oh, saying how she's the brave one and, and Abby isn't, is that um, she was already planning to quit months ago because she wasn't being paid enough at the network. In my brief interactions with Liz, you know, visiting D.C., Liz Wall is the other reporter who, quote, resigned on, on television. We played her yesterday on the show, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, my brief interactions with her when I was in D.C., my impression of her is that she is completely apolitical and she is merely a line reporter who just reads scripts, you know, that I don't even know if she even wrote herself. Stark contrast to Abby, who actually has full editorial control over her show, writes all her own material. You know, Abby's position and platform on her show is what Abby would be doing if anybody else gave her an outlet. It's like it has nothing to do with, you know, the Russian point of view, essentially. And what Liz Wall was doing was actually just reading, you know, news headlines on the on the network. And I just find it interesting the way that it's like the media is trying to, you know, the media is propping up Liz Wall as this person who, you know, had some sort of genuine expression on the air. But while she did it, she promoted the U.S. military and said, I'm proud to be an American. Yeah. Huge contrast to what Abby did. <laughs> well, absolutely, and you're right. She does look like a script reader, and not a very good one, I, I should add. I hate to be critical of that, but it isn't that hard to do. I, I stay away from scripts on this show, as most people can tell by listening. <laughs> But there, there's Liz Wall on Cavuto, literally like the next day, and you could just see her fitting in with the airhead mindless news babes like Megyn Kelly and the others over there at Fox News. That's exactly what they want over there. I I'm, I'm, wouldn't surprise me if she gets some kind of a desk job there. Yeah, I mean, my, my prediction for her is that they'll give her some kind of small test run desk job. She'll, she'll flounder. Um, she won't do very good. And then we might see her on one of those, like, reality shows, you know, with the hodgepodge <laughs> celebrity mashups that they do, like, you know, months down the road or something. 
But she was a big reporter on RT, Robbie, so she'll have her own media website that everybody will be flocking to all of a sudden. I've seen this over and over and over again. Meanwhile, your sister still over at RT and surviving this. I loved what she did. We played the J.P. Pierce Morgan, as I call him. We played his that clip where just the look on his face where she throws that back to him. He's trying to nail her on, you know, the propaganda channel, RT, and that it's state-run media, et cetera, et cetera. And then you look at, uh, of course, our media is a complete abject joke. Played that again on the show yesterday, and she just completely spun that around on him. She uh, owned him and did it in a very professional and calm way, not like a raving lunatic. Exactly, yeah. And, I mean, that the point she was trying to bring up on Piers Morgan is an interesting one because, you, you know, you can make the argument that, well, it's not possible that six corporations – you know, owning the media could be anything nearly as bad as one, you know, state owning a media organization. But what Abby brought into full view is that somehow it's worse, um, that the U.S. media is actually worse, even though, in theory, it's owned by six different, you know, supposedly autonomous corporations. And that, and that's a, that's a very interesting thing because if, a, if one state owned network, is actually providing not only a counter view to the American media, but a more varied view with actually more differing voices in the American media, then we have a serious problem yeah. here. I mean, that, and I think that's what people are missing from this is that the U.S. media is incredibly controlled, even though on the surface it seems autonomous from the government. But what we're seeing now is it clearly not. Well, it's just the other way around. We live in a fascist government, Robbie, as I'm sure you would agree. So the corporations run the government here. So it's, exactly. yeah. you know, yeah. and then what you can do with a, a corporate channel, say General Electric or Comcast or any of these, uh, it used to be Westinghouse, uh, now it's Viacom, Sumner Redstone or, or Rupert Murdoch, you know, what you can do is you can take a few people at the top and you could spread the editorial fever down below. Anyone knows if they step out of line, they go out of it even a little bit, just as Abby might have done, they're, they're finished. They're out of there. I mean, look at all the guys that left MSNBC from Alec Baldwin to Keith Obamaman to the Young Turks. They were all saying once they got out of there that they were told what to say all the time. And I loved how <laughs> J.P. Pierce Morgan, no one's ever tried to tell me what to say. Uh, <laughs> right. Really? I mean, that's not flying. No one's buying that. So you could make an argument that state-run media, maybe even Chinese media or Venezuelan media or Russian media, what have you, gives you uh, more of an opinion than corporate media. I think that's a good debate to have. Absolutely. And I, and I think it's, it's interesting when you watch you know, the way people have been responding to this this. Time Warner Comcast merger and, the, and everybody, you know, even the mainstream media keeps using the word throttling. They say, they keep saying that, you know, because these two corporations are now joined together, net neutrality is gone, you know, because of some new legislation passed, and now companies are able to legally throttle content on the internet and make, you know, give more, um, you know, higher bandwidth speeds to things that they want and give lower bandwidth speeds to things like Netflix or you know, content that they don't like, like maybe porn or torrenting. And I, I almost see a parallel between the way the media it throttles people. I mean, it's almost like they they actually are able to, I mean, the same concept can be applied to the, the behavior of people working for these media organizations. Is because the ownership is so condensed to these six corporations, they can literally throttle the opinions and, and choose which opinions rise to the top, choose which ones are marginalized, and that's how it's worked for years and years. Yeah. I mean, it's nothing new at all No, to the way they do it. I, I had a, two weeks I worked with Fox News. I had my own station, but we were playing a little five top-of-the-hour news affiliates. So I got to go to the conventions back in 2004, Robbie, and I got to work in the truck with all of the main Fox producers and all the guys and – and I saw exactly how it worked. I mean, they don't go around whipping you and threatening you and telling you what to say, but they'll put a little memo on your desk, and this is the stuff they want covered. And if you want to keep your job, you cover that. That's what you do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And the, and the concept of self-censorship is also right. something that I think people neglect to talk about, which is just you being in that environment. You know, if you're a reporter working at Fox News or yeah. CNN, you teach yourself – you condition your own self to not speak about certain things because you know, you, you start to sense as you're working in an environment like that where the boundaries are. 
and and you intuitively know where those boundaries are. So a lot of these reporters probably don't even have to get memos put on their desk, and they just censor themselves, knowing what you know is the wrong thing to say. Right. No, this is a really good point, and self censorship, of course, is the the most rabid form of censorship too. But but it's not only that you know what you're supposed to do and you're kind of a cog in the wheel at a big corporation and you just kind of go along to get along. You are surrounded by other people doing that, and it becomes a little bit contagious. And I'll tell you back again when I was at the conventions and I'm in the convention hall and all the people with their signs and they're all rooting on Bush and Cheney. And, and at one point I had to catch myself and go – Maybe I'm all wrong about everything I say. Maybe I need to be, you know, helping George Bush win the election. No, 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 stop. It's, I mean, it's insidious. It gets in, and it is a global group think that really kind of gets to every little part of our lives. Yeah, and I think that the group think mentality really comes into full view. You know, me being on the inside of this media blitz, uh, you know, I, I haven't had any coverage about me luckily, you know, smear coverage, but being on the inside of it and seeing how distorted all the media coverage about Abby has been the last four days or so, it's really interesting because it's, it's the group think doesn't just infect, um, you know, the, the establishment, the war hawks, it also affects sort of the, you know, what we perceive to be on, on quote unquote, the right side too. Um, and I think that's only just obvious to me because I know you know, I know the truth about Abby and her brother. I know, I know her very well. Um, I know the truth about what happened with Liz Wall, that it was all a staged event to boost the careers of both Jamie Kerchick and her simultaneously. They're trying to, they have a mutually beneficial relationship where they're trying to, um, you know, get jobs elsewhere. And it's, it's just fascinating to watch, you know, all sides of the media spectrum distort what Abby said or why she did it. Um, you know, even I, I was reading some Paul Craig Roberts um, and Webster Tarpley writings about it, and they kind of, I mean, they kind of botched and distorted what, what Abby even was trying to say mm. on the show. And, you know, usually I, I read Paul Craig Roberts, and I'm pretty, you know, in tune with what he's saying. Yeah, he's but good. He, yeah. he had to reach towards distortions to sort of, you know, write a narrative about Abby. And it just kind of makes me realize that pretty much every reporter on the planet puts their own distortions and narrative on a particular story for their, you know, for their own purposes. Right. No, and I'm trying not, I've been trying not to do that. I have, you know, a personal investment in, in y'all and your family, and, you know, I like you guys, and so I am, you're also a great artist, and that I appreciate. So, I, you know, obviously I'm maybe a little emotionally invested, but I'm not, uh, not to the point where I'm going to twist somebody's words. So I do have to ask you a couple of questions because people have, and I want to give you the chance to kind of clear a few things up, and then we're going to move on to the stuff that I originally had booked you to come on for. Because as I mentioned, we we booked this interview before all this blew up. But and, and yeah, I'm no fan of Webster Trapley, as I call him, <laughs> the Fulbright scholar, who uh, we caught um, taking money from the Duponts at one point. Yeah, I just outed him. That's, that's how I roll here. I got nothing to lose <laughs> at this point. Okay, but let's let's talk about a couple of the things that do seem um, that could be perceived anyway, Robbie, as a conflict of interest, right? Uh, the first one is the Pierre Amidar first look media and the whole Glenn Greenwald thing. Um, there has been some credit criticism, I guess, towards Abby. And, and, and by the way, we would have had her on here to defend herself. But if she comes on and I ask the, the wrong question or something and that could be used against her, I don't I don't even I didn't even ask her, quite frankly, because I don't want to put her in that position. And hopefully your interview today won't be <laughs> on CNN tomorrow. That's and happened. I just want to make sure. You know, I don't want to make absolutely clear that I'm not speaking yeah. on behalf of her. Right. I, mean, I, I have my own opinions. I have my own views. Right. Um, so I'll give you as accurate answers as I possibly yeah. can. No, and I I'm, I appreciate you saying that. So I guess one of the things might be here is that because Pierre Amidar had co-funded this Ukrainian revolution, when we're looking at the documents, it, it, it appears he had some kind of an interest in this, a, a Sorosian kind of an interest in uh, helping these revolution groups in Ukraine. Now, people can judge that for whatever it's worth, but he also has this new, uh, he's the rich uncle of Glenn Greenwald and now 
Matt Tybee, who he's taken from Rolling Stone, and uh, as you know, Jeremy Scahill and others it, with First Look Media. So it was there anything intentional or unintentional or conscious or unconscious and maybe playing into that? Because that's, I guess, one of the perceptions that are out there, that maybe she would go to First Look and benefit from that, or maybe this is something to please Pierre, the very rich uh, media uncle out there. Um, well, what do you know about that? And let's see if we can clear that up. Well, I mean, Glenn Greenwald wrote a story about what Abby did on TV. And as far as the the story he wrote about it, it was, you know, it followed in the wake of sort of all the other media coverage about what Abby did. And, you know, the, any connection between Abby and, and Glenn Greenwald kind of ends there because, um, I mean, you know, he he hasn't ever really communicated with her before or promoted her work or anything like that in the past. Um, I think maybe like we wrote a transcript of some speech he did at the ACLU like three years ago on media roots and he tweeted it. Like that was probably the Mm -hmm. most, the closest we ever got to Glenn Greenwald that me and Abby. And yeah, I mean, I mean a lot of people are writing, you know, um, critiques or, or, or doing investigative reports on Pierre Omidyar right now. Um, I, I personally really am on board with, with what Greenwald is doing on his media outlet. I have some questions myself about Pierre Omidyar. Um, but, you know, I mean, beyond that, I, I don't really have much of an opinion mm. on it. I mean, I can just tell you that there is no linkage between Abby and Greenwald. So this I wasn't mean, what, some kind of a, a move to a publicity stunt to, to um, up the stakes, so to speak. She won't be go. We won't find her on first look media here in a few months. I highly doubt it. I mean, <laughs> okay. I, I can't say never. I mean, I, I, you know, I'd have no idea what the future is going to hold, but I, I highly doubt that's going to happen. Yeah, I think the problem has been here is there's a conflict of interest, as you know, because a meteor is a PayPal guy. He's it maybe has some some suspicious NSA connections or at least has to work with them or is forced to work with them. And then you've got Greenwald with all the Snowden stuff, most of it which we haven't even seen yet, who, um, you know, is, is blowing the lid off of all this. So it, it looks kind of funny and it looks like a conflict of interest. And I know myself and, and – James Corbett and um, um, Sibel Edmonds and a few others have been a little critical of this. And then the response we got was we were called Jew haters and racist and conspiracy theorists from Glenn Greenwald. It wasn't, okay, I understand how this might look, but um, I, you know, I'm doing the best I can here, and this is just how it goes, and this is how the game is played. And no, it's, it, they <laughs> yell anti Semite at us. I, it is a little suspicious, no? Well, I mean, I, you know, I have been following the Sibel Edmonds thing, and I'll, and my own opinion on the whole thing is that I do think some of the questions that Sibel raised on Boiling Frogs are legitimate, but I definitely think she went way too far in her assertions in terms of trying to claim that Pierre is actually working with the NSA or that Glenn Greenwald is somehow not releasing stories until he gets, like, paid by certain people. I think that kind of stuff took it a little bit you know, not not just a little bit too far, but took it much too far for me. Um, and I think if she left it just at the questions and tried to, you know, hone in on those, I think it would have been more effective. Well, but. yeah, but nobody's perfect. Okay, so Greenwald. Actually, I've been a big fan of Glenn Greenwald over the years. I thought I really loved how he stood up to people like at MSNBC, et cetera. So. He kind of had me at hello. I don't agree with some of his politics, but I don't agree with anyone's politics. So I'm kind of, I'm on an island, okay? So I'm used to that. But um, this is some suspicious things there, and I don't want to beat that dead horse too much. I think I've asked the question, and, and I feel comfortable with it. But let's remember that Sybil Edmonds, she's not perfect either. And so what we're trying to do here in the sub-alternative media is to question the establishment alternative media to try to keep them honest. Otherwise, they just build these giant big tents, and they suck up everything. You get that. Oh, for sure. I mean, I'm, I am for being critical of, of anyone. Um, but I do see... There's an interesting parallel that this guy, Jamie Kerchick, who tried to smear Abby the, probably the hardest, and all of his, um, you know, his Israel-supporting neoconservative buddies online are also trying to, have been trying to take down Glenn Greenwald the hardest as well. So I, I find it an interesting parallel yeah. that, you know, here is Abby, someone I know is honest, has integrity, 
is actually a threat to the establishment, you know, being attacked by the same people who are trying every day to take down Glenn Greenwald for completely different reasons than, than the Pierre Omidyar connections. Yeah. Um, you know, they think Glenn Greenwald is an anti, you know, is, is, is working with the Russian government and all this stuff. They made accusations about Snowden being a Russian agent. And that's a whole nother side of the yeah. pack for Glenn Greenwald. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I think that it's, it's something that I can't really answer for, but I can tell you that there's no connection whatsoever between Abby and Glenn Greenwald. Okay, no, and I, I'm glad we uh, call it clearing the air. At least I'm doing my job, as you understand, right, Robbie? I, I have to ask these questions, and so oh. that's what we're doing. The um, Speaking of, uh, what's his name, Jamie Kirkpatrick? He's the one that went on the air and accused Abby of being a 9-11 truther, crazy. She believes government puts fluoride in the water. I don't know where she would have gotten something like that. Uh, you know, <laughs> that it's, she's like a John Bircher thing. She's some kind of a right, extreme right winger. I mean, we just, they're just really pulling anything they can out. Um, we know that Jeremy Scahill has been very unkind to anyone that asks questions about 9-11. Matt Tybee has been very unkind to people in the South and conservatives and teabaggers. You see what I'm saying? So that whole kind of crew gets into the next question because Kirkpatrick, you know, accused her of being a 9-11 truther. And then I saw on a friendly side, I can't remember the name of it, that she had, um, it looked like she had refuted that, though she had said, uh, we believe we were lied to about 9-11. She wanted to distance herself from it being an inside job. And some people, Robbie, as you can imagine, have taken some exception to that. Yeah. And I, and I can understand, you know, her, her views have evolved over the years. Um, you know, as, as you can imagine, anyone you know who, who, you know, uh, who's as young as Abby, ha- you know, transitions from you know maybe certain more extreme views to more reasonable ones over time. And I think you know what she was trying to do with that statement is is basically say these are the facts. Um, you know, we were we were lied to on 9/11. Uh, the 9/11 Commission was a cover up. The commissioners themselves say so. Yeah. Um, and I think. You know, she, she was trying to open up a, a wider dialogue where, you know, people wouldn't be able to level this criticism on her based on a video that she did, I think was it something like six years ago, um, where she's saying 9-11 was an inside job. And I think, I mean, I, I personally agree with um, the idea that using the phrase inside job um, is perhaps not the best. It is really, isn't it? I don't even think truth is that great of a, a reference. I was always really critical of that because it says, I know the truth and you don't. It sounds a little elitist, but inside job, when you say that to the establishment and to people that don't know anything about all this, they oh, you're saying that Bush had a plunger and pushed the plunger on 9-11. You know what I'm saying? So it does kind of uh, take us off where we really want to go, which is we were lied to, they had prior knowledge, there was a stand down, there was a cover up, and who benefits? I think these are all valid questions, though you can't get to, to Fox or Kirkpatrick with those. I saw, um, what's his name, Long Balls, uh, the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one reporter with the really long face. Uh, God, I can't remember his name. All of a sudden, it'll it'll come to me. But he Fox was. News. Go ahead. Was it on Fox News? Yeah, he's a main Fox News guy, and he's got a really long double face, kind of a thing. But anyway, I'm on the tip of my tongue. It, I know, right? It'll come to me too. But he was caught on camera when he didn't know he was on camera talking to We Are Change, saying, "Oh, you guys are dead on. You should be asking these questions. I think there's a lot of good questions here that you're asking." So they, again, they can't say that on Fox News. That's not the company line. Yeah, I mean, it, this is the thing: is that Fox News? I mean, Fox News, CNN. I just watched something on Fox News where they did a 20 minute long piece on how it was just recent re- recently revealed that there was actually an FBI mole that had yeah. direct contact with bin Laden as early as 1993, who was aware of, you know, ter- terrorist attacks that involved hijackings being launched in the United States. So these networks are well aware that we were lied to on 9-11, but yet when you're able to put someone in a box like, you know, Kerchik and these other um, smear job people have done or have tried to do, when you put them in a box and make them, you know, 
you know, people who are only saying that 9-11 is yeah. a side job or who are only saying Bush did it. Well, let me say this real quick before we have to go to break. Robbie Martin with us will come back and talk about uh, all the things that uh, we wanted to bring them on in the beginning. They, they ask you this question. They did this to Deborah Medina, the, gu- the gubernatorial candidate on the Glenn Beck show, because there's no right answer. If you answer it the way that the 9-11 truth movement wants you to answer it, then they'll kill you. If you way they want you to answer it or anywhere in between, then the 9-11 truth movement will kill you. And it's just, there's no right answer to it. I'm, know, what can I tell you, folks? That they know they're smart. And this is, uh, the guillotine hanging over all of our heads, I guess, eventually. We'll be right back. More on the Jack Blood Show right after this. We'll begin tonight with our big story, and the crisis of conscience seems to be playing out live on TV on the Russian-owned English channel RT America. Liz Wall, an anchor, quit on air today, two days after Abby Martin shot the world when she looked directly into the camera, condemning Russia's move into the Ukraine. Before we wrap up the show, I wanted to say something from my heart about the ongoing political crisis in Ukraine and Russia's military occupation of Crimea. Just because I work here for RT doesn't mean I don't have editorial independence. And I can't stress enough how strongly I am against any state intervention in a sovereign nation's affairs. What Russia did is wrong. I admittedly don't know as much as I should about Ukraine's history or the cultural dynamics of the region. But what I do know is that military intervention is never the answer. And I will not sit here and apologize or defend military aggression. Furthermore, the coverage I've seen of Ukraine has been truly disappointing from all sides of the media spectrum and rife with disinformation. Above all, my heart goes out to the Ukrainian people, who are now wedged as pawns in the middle of a global power chess game. They're the real losers here. All we can do now is hope for a peaceful outcome for a terrible situation and prevent another full-blown Cold War between multiple superpowers. Until then, I'll keep telling the truth as I see it. Abby Martin joins me live now. Welcome, uh, Abby. Obviously, uh, we're all pretty shocked by what you did and po- possibly even more shocked by Liz Wall, who actually quit on air today. Were you tempted to do what Liz Wall did? And what is your reaction to her decision to actually resign? I support Liz with whatever decision she wants to make. Um, but for me, I, you know, I knew going into that that I could put my job on the line considering how the corporate media has fired multiple anchors for simply speaking out against the Iraq war. So I did know that, you know, going against the editorial line of my network, I could put my job on the line. And fortunately, that hasn't happened yet. What kind of pressure have you come under internally, if any, from management to perhaps rein back your position or to take other kind of action? Or have they warned you about your conduct? Uh, surprisingly, Piers, after I made that statement, I mean, it goes in line with everything I've been saying for the past uh, couple of years. Uh, I'm staunchly anti-military interventionist, and so on the network, I towed that same line. I stay true to my beliefs and my moral compass, and uh, management was supportive. I mean, I talked to my boss today. He said, we support you, um, and I told him, I said, if, you know, if I disagree with something that Russia is doing, I will continue to speak out, and they give me the complete editorial freedom to do whatever I want on my show, breaking the set. Um, and all I can really speak for is what I do on my show. I mean, are you concerned about other parts of the programming on RT America? I mean, do you believe that although your show may have that kind of independence of voice, that a lot of the other programming doesn't and has drifted in the last week into blatant propaganda? Here's no different than every other corporate media station. I mean, we're talking about six corporations that control 90% of what Americans see, hear, and read. The lead-up to the Iraq war, parodying exactly what the establishment said. I mean, you could reflect the exact same criticism on all the corporate media channels. So, you know, I can only speak for my show. I stay true to my moral compass, but um, RT toes a perspective of the Russian foreign policy, just as the entire corporate media apparatus toes the perspective of the U.S. establishment. What is your specific criticism about the way RT America has covered this crisis? Uh, You know, I just saw the way that the entire media apparatus was covering it. I mean, RT was covering it in a different way that I didn't agree with. And then I saw the corporate media coverage almost almost wanting to revive the Cold War. I mean, I felt like people were egging on Obama to attack militarily. I mean, 
it's insane living in a time where we have corporate media actually supporting military intervention and action against Russia. I mean, this is no joke here. We got to really take a step back and think about how we can do things peacefully and diplomatically and not continue to warmonger and fearmonger the American people about what's going on. And tell me this. I mean, you in the clip we played at the start when you made your dramatic statement, you, you conceded you weren't an expert in what is going on in Ukraine or indeed in Ukraine itself. I presume now you've probably come up to speed pretty quickly, given all the attention that you've had. What do you think, with all your experience of broadcasting on RT America, is the correct way for this crisis to be resolved? I hope it resolves diplomatically, Piers. You know, you can imagine the last couple of days have been pretty hectic. I haven't really been able to keep up with the with the day to day, but I just hope for a peaceful outcome with no more military aggression. I hope the military aggression scaled back, and I hope we can see a peaceful outcome. But I think that the real question that should be asked is, why do I have to work for RT to tell the truth? about corporations and the U.S. government. I mean, seriously, you guys are beholden to advertisers that you cannot criticize, and that's why I work for a station that I can criticize. Well, hang on, hang on. Hang sure. on a sec. I'm, I'm, free to say what, I'm free to say what the hell I like. Sure. No one's ever told me I can't criticize advertisers or corporate entities. That, that conversation has never happened in the three years I've been on there at CNN. covering 194,000 square miles and bringing the people's voice to little towns all across America. big fan of Putin either, but I can't remember the last time he sent his flying death robots to kill kids on a basketball court, or at a picnic, or at a cafe.
Mm, that is uh, our guest today, Robbie Martin, his band Fluorescent Gray, performing We Killed Kids on a Basketball Court. That's all live mix, folks, for you guys out there, you guys and gals that get into DJing. This is called Intelligent Dance Music, and Robbie Martin is amazing at it. Robbie, great to have you with us. That's why I wanted you to come on the show. I was blown away by that. You on Breaking the Set with your 9-11 sticker, prominently displayed on your laptop, running uh, 10 different machines at once to make that sound that we just heard. That was excellent, man. What do you say to that? Ah, thanks. I appreciate it. You want my autograph or something, dude? I mean, whatever. (laughs) <laughs> Talk about your, your music a little bit and your record company, and uh, also you are, are still doing. I think you're still doing a show with Media Roots, right? I, I should know this, but I do radio. I don't listen to a lot of it. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the, the podcast first. Uh, the, the podcast Abby and I have been doing um, predated Breaking the Set, and it's it's uh, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it goes you know up to three hours. It's not live, so we record it. Um, you know, so that's why it's varying length. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about some of, you know, some of this stuff for, for years and years. And, and I think I posted to you a couple of days ago, um, the episode we did from two years ago where we kind of predicted that this standoff between Russia and the United States was inevitable. Um, and that's not that crazy of a prediction to make. I mean, I think a lot of people saw the signifiers yeah. over the years. Um, but I think the thing that really, kicked us off into into thinking this was an inevitability was the um you know our visit to the lawrence livermore lab in livermore when we when we did this investigative report um in the city next next to the city that we grew up in which was pleasanton um and we realized that the u.s government was trying to basically greenwash this virtual nuclear weapons testing lab um and, you know, it kind of got us thinking, well, why is the United States still so intent on doing the nuclear arms race? You know, maybe they're not actually blowing up real nuclear bombs um, above ground anymore, but they're doing it in computers. They're doing it in these weird simulated environments and stuff like that. So this so this episode we did on Media Roots Radio was, was about, you know, Russia's vetoing. I think it was Russia and China vetoed um, the Syrian sanctions uh, vote in the U.N., and I remember when Clinton, when Hillary Clinton went out and, and was talking about it, it sounded like she was essentially posturing us towards an, another Cold War from her words. And this was, I think, back in 2000 and maybe 2012 that this happened. Um, so that was, yeah, so that was kind of like we, and we've been talking about this ever since on our, on our radio show that this sort of standoff was, was inching closer and closer. And, uh, yeah, and you can you can go check that that um, show out at uh, soundcloud.com slash media roots or just at media roots dot org. Um, mm-hmm. And then uh, to jump to my music, um, we you know we we include a lot of just weird electronic music and and you know a lot of it's my own music. A lot of it is just other people's um, IDM or or weird you know experimental music or electronic music in the podcast. And uh, so it's just kind of an interesting intersection that, that here I am, you know, many years later, and this is kind of my first attempt to even mix music with politics directly, you know, because with the podcast, it was always sort of in the background. It wasn't ever directly intertwined with the political um, talk we were having, but now it was kind of like my opportunity to just be like, okay, um, you know, what can I do to, right. um, you know, to, to inject my own politics into the music that I've already been doing for, you know, more than a decade. There is a, a band here in Atlanta called Deer Hunter that has an album, an EP, I think, called Fluorescent Gray. So I guess that can be confusing to people, but uh, it's not. you got a Robbie Martin at Fluorescent Gray. And that's the name of the name of his project. Well, I mean, this is how it happens. But you know what? I'm I'm actually really happy to see people like you doing this experimental music because I'd lost faith in new music largely, other than a few you know back channels that I pay attention to. And and though I'm you know a, a big guitar guy and all of that, I I keep an open mind. I like all kinds of good music, and certainly where it uh, has political overtones. And a lot of my friends do amazing work like this. Too numerous to mention. We play them on the show all the time. All different kinds of music that has this kind of awareness component to it. And I really am a big believer that you'll reach more people through a song like that 
or through a book or something than you will through political action in a political revolution. It's got to be really kind of a culture jamming revolution. And that's what people seem to get almost by osmosis. So the more music we see that has viable content in it, and I'm not forcing people to do that. Be tricky about it if you want. You don't have to, you know, wear your heart on your sleeve, so to speak. But but talk to people. Talk about things that are important rather than just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And the the culture will go with you. You know. Yeah, I I completely agree. I, I think music and art are are particularly powerful tools to send a subversive political message in, you know, and actually kind of, you know, possibly, you know, put these little cracks in the foundation of, of what this is, you know, this whole establishment's all about. Um, and, you know, I was, I was only a child during the 80s, but, I mean, looking back on it, it seemed like that was sort of the end you know, at least as far as the mainstream music was concerned, the 80s were sort of a golden age for political, you know, like the last bastion of like mainstream, hard-hitting like political music. Um, you know, we had bands like the Dead Kennedys writing, you know, very subversive and very direct, you know, directly critical of the oh, yeah. U.S. government uh, songs continuously, Public Enemy, um, you know, was, was fairly mainstream, um, constantly writing music against the system. Um, and then came the 90s, and, you know, it started to take more of a escapist, you know, throwback kind of 70s, you know, grunge, alternative rock. Wasn't very much... Grunge politics. was born in the 80s, real grunge, so we'll just to get that straight. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then came, you know, the aughts, as people call them. And then it seemed like politics from music almost completely vanished, um, you know, with a few exceptions. I think, like... Michael Moore directed a music video for a System of a Down song where he, it was just like footage of all the Iraq war protests. So there was, and then I think Eminem did like a, you know, kind of a song mobilizing activism and he had a, a clip in his video, you know, from that New York Post cover saying that Bush knew about 9-11. Yeah. And so there's little bits of that through, you know, through the last decade or so, but it's just actually really remarkable to think that we had one of the most fascist, openly warmongering, insane administrations during a time when there was almost no subversive political music like breaking through the mainstream. Gee, that was quite a coincidence, wasn't it, Robbie? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. It? Um, you, the same thing with with the, the six media companies, the six record companies, and the six oil companies. 666, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and I remember I w it was actually really funny um, not to bring up Michael Moore again because I'm you know, i not, I'm not a Michael Moore lover, but on on Twitter, I remember right when Obama won in 2008, he tweeted, this is a great era for musicians and artists everywhere to come out of hiding and celebrate. Like, we have, you know, you know now it's time for the arts and the music and all. And he was saying all this stuff. And, you know, I waited, you know, a, a year passed, 2009, waited another year, and nothing happened. I mean, we, it's almost like people are even more silent because, you know, most most artists and musicians tend to be, and I'm generalizing here, but they tend to be more left leaning people. I would say no, that's fair. Uh, you know, especially younger musicians. So it almost was more silent during the Obama administration than it was even during the Bush administration, as far as politically subversive music. And it's it's still just as bad. You know, I mean, we see some politically subversive movies uh, in a very general sense, and that's probably the best we get you know v for vendetta um you know maybe a handful of other examples of films mainstream films that have broken through but you know in general it's pretty dismal there's i mean like you said most of this music is being done on the underground circuit you know um and you could find it if you seek it out but right. it's it's not well, no, all music is underground now if it's not Justin Bieber or, or Miley Cyrus. It, it, this is a whole new thing we could get into, and I don't think we'll have time, but I've asked a lot of my musician friends. In fact, I just had a, you've got a record label, recordlabelrecords.org, folks, and I had Bruce Pavitt on last week, uh, who was the founder of Sub Pop Records, and we haven't published that yet. He, he dropped a few bombshells, but I ask everybody this, and and that is, you know, where does the music go? Where is the machine going? Because, you know, a lot of people aren't getting out. And certainly people aren't getting paid unless they can get on the road and they're good at organizing shows and promoting themselves. Man, there's no money 
into being an artist now. Not that it's about money, but it's about eating sometimes and you know, having a place to sleep. No one's trying to get rich, I don't think. But So it's it's become harder, and there really isn't much of an apparatus, is there, Robbie? We're inventing that now. How can we monetize? How can we commercialize? And just to the point where, you know, we could make a living, where I don't have to give all my work away for free, you know, and I'm seeing subscription based um, content is getting pretty big now. And yeah, people can, I guess, you know, if they get a million views on their YouTube, maybe they'll get a little record deal or they'll get some advertisers. But, you know, let's face it, uh, musicians, artists, they're, they're not very good at business a lot of the time anyway. So it, it was nice to have a, a sub-record label company like a SST Records or a small or a sub-pop or something where you could branch out and you can get distribution and a little bit of help organizing your concert so you can make a couple of bucks, you know, a upgrade from the bicycle to the Volvo or whatever, you know. But it just doesn't seem to be infrastructure now. That is, I guess, exciting. They're creating it right, right as we speak. Yeah, I mean, there's so many avenues now for an artist to put their music directly in the hands of an audience and, and eliminate the middleman. And, um, you know, a great website for that, I think I mentioned this on Abby's show, um, but I'm going to plug it again here, because any independent musician out there who is not familiar with the business end of things, um, and I don't blame them for not being familiar with it, because it's mostly completely BS, um, but the website bandcamp.com um is a great website for you. You can upload your album, your songs, and you can directly monetize the, the the music. You can even have it up there for free and have people pay whatever they want. You know, like donation based. Um, and I think that's sort of where things are heading as far as what indie musicians. Yeah. No, that's much. great. That's actually great. One time at Bandcamp, that's actually great. I know a lot of people that are on it, my friends Wamu and others, so I like that. And so you guys can check it out. It's just Bandcamp. Pretty easy to find out there. Record label records dot org. That's your record label, Robbie Martin. Are you signing people over there? Are you developing artists? What are you doing? Right now, I mean, because of what you just mentioned, I mean I'm not gonna repeat everything you just said because it was very on point, but the the you know the business end of running a record label is very difficult. So, with my record label right now, what I'm doing is I'm trying to lower my own manufacturing costs so I can be able to um, you know produce content um, on a regular basis. And um, believe it or not, uh, cassettes are actually kind of making a comeback right now, um, and they seem to be a really good avenue for. <laughs> You know, not just my label, but other labels as well, to be able to manufacture, um, you know, like a professional looking and sounding cassette for, at a very, very low cost, um, per unit cost. So, that's kind of the direction wow. I'm in right now, um, actually. Good for you. And a lot of my friends still making records, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, no, vinyl records, I've, I put out, I think I just put out my 12th vinyl record on my label, but, you know, vinyl, vinyl record manufacturing is still pretty pricey, uh, unfortunately. Um, but there's also other avenues for that. Like if you want to release an ultra-limited edition, you can get one-offs made of, of vinyl records at certain places, you know, for $20 a pop, um, things like that. So there's, you know, if you're clever enough and you navigate around sort of this, this mass production, you know, corporate um, mass yeah. distribution paradigm you can you can find ways to get your music out well, there. that's the exciting thing look i've taken a lot of financial hits because the media has completely changed and how people are able to you know get a podcast or a, because now everybody can do a radio show it kind of muddies the water a little bit you know everybody's in the garage and they know one chord on the guitar and now they're all rock stars and it you know it makes it harder for guys like me who have been around for a long time, but I'm I'm willing to change with the time, so we've begun to get into and advance into new medias as well. I, I, I'm not here to hold back progress or hold back uh, people speaking or whatever, So, but it is something new, and we are developing it, and you know, I think whatever we can realize is what we can do, Robbie. I think we should never hold back uh, to old paradigms. I completely agree. I mean, and now, you know, now is this, is this beautiful opportunity for anyone you know, not just musicians, but, you know, people who want to get their political opinion out there, people who want to make independent films, um, to to do things to get to, to reach an audience directly. I mean, 
you know, even if you're a filmmaker and you want to produce a movie, I mean, you have websites like Kickstarter now where you can make a trailer, you know, a, a short film of your film and get funding for the rest of it, yeah. you know, if it's something that's appealing enough to people out there. Trying to get my buddy to do that for his book, and he wants to write another book, but he's uh, broke, even though everybody read his last two books, he has no money. So, <laughs> I mean, there you go. Yeah. It's the same thing. What I was going to say awesome. is that uh, also Bandcamp is awesome. My guitar player has a very cutting-edge website called Weed Share. Yeah, you guys will like that. Weedshare.com, and it uses uh, the most brilliant cloud technology. He's way ahead of the pack on that, and uh, certainly I think he'd probably like it if that took off after the 10 years of development. That's where my band stuff is. That's why we're not on Bandcamp. All right, quickly, uh, Robbie Martin is with us. Robbie. You, you performed on Breaking the Set in your Freemason coat. You pretend to be a Freemason on Facebook. It freaks everyone out. Clear that up. And I loved how you talked about how you thought that the Boston Tea Party was a false flag, a Freemasonic false flag event. So, A, what is your affiliation with Freemasons? And, B, um, what, what was the story on that? Well, my affiliation with Freemasons is that I was shown a pretty hilarious Monty Python sketch maybe, I don't know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago now, of um, called the Architect Sketch. And, uh, you know, any Python fans out there, any non-Python fans out there should at least look up this sketch, because John Cleese is just, it's just a sketch where John Cleese breaks down while doing a job proposal interview, and he just starts groveling to the people interviewing him, saying, please let me become a Freemason, I want to be like you, and have all your secret handshakes, and um, I was, I had no idea who the Freemasons were at the time, so like, you know, my friend, uh, was kind of obsessed with them. He thought they were really funny, um, and I started to read more about them, and I started to think they were pretty funny. You know, just, I thought I was just a bunch of stuffy old men who would get together, wear these silly costumes and top hats, and, you know, talk esoteria, uh, you know, it, not letting their wives or, or their daughters come. But, I mean, it turns out that the Freemasons actually, have a very interesting history in terms of their involvement with the American Revolution. Big time. Well, I only have about, I just want to warn you, I only have about two minutes, so don't don't okay. go too far, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, basically, just for anybody out there listening, um, you know, the American Revolution, as idyllic and as, as nice as the story is, I mean, it involved a lot of subversion and deceptions by founding fathers and, and other various... Freemasons, um, you know, like, for example, Benjamin Franklin, um, who was a Freemason, used his newspaper outlets to exaggerate um, the British uh, soldier activity in the United States, like, you know, raping women um, and burning storefronts and stuff Throwing like that. babies out of incubators, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I just find it interesting that a lot of people in the Patriot Movement, you know, don't they haven't really looked at the Freemasonic uh, angle of the American Revolution. I mean, when you talk to Freemasons, they brag about the fact that they yeah. did the Boston Tea Party or that they were behind, um, you know, the Paul Revere uh, infamous, you know, horse ride and all that stuff. So they're, they, they're proud of it. A lot of people say that they are themselves myth makers and that they trump up their own involvement in the revolution. Um, so well, no, of, we can look at the George Washington and his Freemasonic apron and all the rest of it, okay? I mean, that's, look, it, 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 Franklin is a whole different can of worms, and I'd love to talk more about this. I am out of time, but a quadruple agent, in my opinion, part of the Hellfire Club, which was like the skull and bones of its day. I mean, they found dead bodies all over the place and, <laughs> like, torture rooms and stuff. And I want people to go back and read the Perfectibilists. And these are the actual papers of Adam Weisskopf and the Bavarian Illuminati. And what they say, and what I hear the modern-day patriots say, quote-unquote, in the new millennium, are almost identical. It's really scary, man. And that was a big slap in the face for me when I realized that, wow, am I been repeating Illuminati language for the last few years? I mean, I got to... I had to slap myself in the face for that. Great job today, Robbie. I really appreciate your patience with me and everything else. Anything you want to plug real quick before we go? i got about 10 seconds. Um, just uh, look up uh, fluorescent-gray.bandcamp.com. That's where you can grab my music and recordlabelrecords.org. Give Abby my best. We'll talk to you real soon, brother. 
All right. Have Thanks a great weekend. Things. Spend time with your family. Be bold. Mighty forces will come to your aid. Bye. Thanks, Jack. Have a good one. Well, I'm not a big fan of Putin either, but I can't remember the last time he sent his flying death robots to kill kids on a basketball court, or at a picnic, or at a cafe. Mm, that is uh, our guest today, Robbie Martin, his band Fluorescent Gray, performing We Killed Kids on a Basketball Court. That's all live mix, folks, for you guys out there, you guys and gals that get into DJing. This is called Intelligent Dance Music, and Robbie Martin is amazing at it. Robbie, great to have you with us. That's why I wanted you to come on the show. I was blown away by that. You on breaking the set with your 9-11 sticker, prominently displayed on your laptop, running uh, ten different machines at once to make that sound that we just heard. That was excellent, man. What do you say to that? Ah, thanks. I appreciate it. You want my autograph or something, dude? I mean, whatever. (laughs) <laughs> Talk about your your music a little bit and your record company, and uh, also you are are still doing. I think you're still doing a show with Media Roots, right? I, I should know this, but I do radio. I don't listen to a lot of it. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the the podcast first. Uh, the The podcast Abby and I have been doing um, predated Breaking the Set, and it's it's uh, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it goes you know up to three hours. It's not live, so we record it. Um, you know, so that's why it's varying length. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about some of, you know, some of this stuff for, for years and years. And, and I think I posted to you a couple of days ago, um, the episode we did from two years ago where we kind of predicted that this standoff between Russia and the United States was inevitable. Um, and that's not that crazy of a prediction to make. I mean, I think a lot of people saw the signifiers yeah. over the years. Um, but I think the thing that really, kicked us off into into thinking this was an inevitability was the um you know our visit to the lawrence livermore lab in livermore when we when we did this investigative report um in the city next next to the city that we grew up in which was pleasanton um and we realized that the u.s government was trying to basically greenwash this virtual nuclear weapons testing lab um and, you know, it kind of got us thinking, well, why is the United States still so intent on doing the nuclear arms race? You know, maybe they're not actually blowing up real nuclear bombs um, above ground anymore, but they're doing it in computers. They're doing it in these weird simulated environments and stuff like that. So this so this episode we did on Media Roots Radio was, was about, you know, Russia's vetoing. I think it was Russia and China vetoed um, the Syrian sanctions uh, vote in the U.N., and I remember when Clint, when Hillary Clinton went out and, and was talking about it, it sounded like she was essentially posturing us towards an, another Cold War from her words. And this was, I think, back in 2000 and maybe 2012 that this happened. Um, so that was, yeah, so that was kind of like we, and we've been talking about this ever since on our, on our radio show that this sort of standoff was, was inching closer and closer. And, uh, yeah, and you can you can go check that that um, show out at uh, soundcloud.com slash media roots or just at media roots dot org. Um, mm-hmm. And then uh, to jump to my music, um, we you know we we include a lot of just weird electronic music and and you know a lot of it's my own music. A lot of it is just other people's um, IDM or or weird you know experimental music or electronic music in the podcast and. Uh, so it's just kind of an interesting intersection that that here I am, you know, many years later, and this is kind of my first attempt to even mix music with politics directly, you know, because with the podcast, it was always sort of in the background. It wasn't ever directly intertwined with the political um, talk we were having, but now it was kind of like my opportunity to just be like, okay, um, you know, what can I do to, right. um, you know, to, to inject my own politics into the music that I've already been doing for, you know, more than a decade. 
There is a, a band here in Atlanta called Deer Hunter that has an album, an EP, I think, called Fluorescent Gray. So I guess that can be confusing to people, but uh, it's not. You got a Robbie Martin at Fluorescent Gray, and that's the name of the name of his project. Well, I mean, this is how it happens. But you know what? I'm I'm actually really happy to see people like you doing this experimental music because I'd lost faith in new music largely, other than a few you know back channels that I pay attention to and. And though I'm, you know, a, a big guitar guy and all of that, I, I keep an open mind. I like all kinds of good music, it's certainly where it uh, has political overtones. And a lot of my friends do amazing work like this, too numerous to mention. We play them on the show all the time, all different kinds of music that has this kind of awareness component to it. And I really am a big believer that you'll reach more people through a song like that or through a book or something, then you will through political action and a political revolution. It's got to be really kind of a culture-jamming revolution. And that's what people seem to get, almost by osmosis. So the more music we see that has viable content in it, and I'm not forcing people to do that. Be tricky about it if you want. You don't have to you know, wear your heart on your sleeve, so to speak. But, but talk to people. Talk about things that are important rather than just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And the, the culture will go with you, you know? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think music and art are are particularly powerful tools to send a subversive political message in, you know, and actually kind of, you know, possibly, you know, put these little cracks in the foundation of of what this is, you know, this whole establishment's all about. Um, and you know, I was I was only a child during the '80s, but I mean looking back on it, it seemed like that was sort of the end, you know, at least as far as the mainstream music was concerned. The 80s were sort of a golden age for political, you know, like the last bastion of, like, mainstream, hard-hitting, like, political music. Um, You know, we had bands like the Dead Kennedys writing, you know, very subversive and very direct, you know, directly critical of the U.S. government uh, songs continuously, Public Enemy, um, you know, was was fairly mainstream, um, constantly writing music against the system. Um, and then came the 90s, and, you know, it started to take more of a escapist, you know, throwback kind of 70s, you know, grunge, alternative rock. Wasn't very much... Grunge quality. was born in the 80s, real grunge, so we'll just to get that straight. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then came, you know, the aughts, as people call them. And then it seemed like politics or music almost completely vanished, um, you know, with a few exceptions. I think, like, Michael Moore directed a music video for a System of a Down song where he, it was just, like, footage of all the Iraq war protests. So there was, and then I think Eminem did, like, a, you know, kind of a song mobilizing activism, and he had a, a clip in his video, you know, from that New York Post cover saying that Bush knew about 9-11. Yeah. And so there's little bits of that through, you know, through the last decade or so, but it's just actually really remarkable to think that we had one of the most fascist, openly warmongering, insane administrations during a time when there was almost no subversive political music like breaking through the mainstream. Gee, that was quite a coincidence, wasn't it, Robbie? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. It? <laughs> um, you, the same thing with with the, the six media companies, the six record companies, and the six oil companies. Six, 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 buddy. <laughs> yeah, and I remember I w- it was actually really funny um, not to bring up Michael Moore again because I, you know, I'm not I'm not a Michael Moore lover. But on on Twitter, I remember right when Obama won in 2008, he tweeted, "This is a great era for musicians and artists everywhere to come out of hiding and celebrate. Like we have, you know, you know, now it's time for the arts and the music and all." And he was saying all this stuff, and you know, I waited. You know, a, a year passed, 2009, waited another year. And nothing happened. I mean, we, it's almost like people are even more silent because, you know, most, most artists and musicians tend to be, and I'm generalizing here, but they tend to be more left leaning people, I would say. No, that's fair. Um, you know, especially younger musicians. So it almost was more silent during the Obama administration than it was even during the Bush administration as far as politically subversive music. And it's, it's still just as bad, you know. I mean, we see some politically subversive movies uh, in a very general sense, and that's probably the best we get. You know, V for Vendetta, um, you know, maybe a handful of other examples of films, mainstream films that have broken through. But, 
you know, in general, it's pretty dismal. There's, I mean, like you said, most of this music is being done on the underground circuit, you know. Um, and you can find it if you seek it out, but right. it's, it's not... Well, no, all music is underground now if it's not Justin Bieber or, or Miley Cyrus. It, it, this is a whole new thing we could get into, and I don't think we'll have time, but I've asked a lot of my musician friends. In fact, I just had... A, you've got a record label, recordlabelrecords.org, folks, and... I had Bruce Pavitt on last week, uh, who was the founder of Sub Pop Records, and we haven't published that yet. He, he dropped a few bombshells, but I ask everybody this, and and that is, you know, where does the music go? Where is the machine going? Because you know, a lot of people aren't getting out, and certainly people aren't getting paid unless they can get on the road and they're good at organizing shows and promoting themselves. Man, there's no money into being an artist now. Not that it's about money, but it's about eating sometimes and. Now having a place to sleep, no one's trying to get rich, I don't think. But so it's it's become harder, and there really isn't much of an apparatus, is there, Robbie? We're inventing that now. How can we monetize? How can we commercialize? And just to the point where you know we could make a living, where I don't have to give all my work away for free, you know. And I'm seeing subscription based um, content is is getting pretty big now, and. Yeah, people can, I guess, you know, if they get a million views on their YouTube, maybe they'll get a little record deal or they'll get some advertisers. But, you know, let's face it, uh, musicians, artists, they're, they're not very good at business a lot of the time anyway. So it, it was nice to have a, a sub-record label company like a SST Records or a small or a sub-pop or something where you could branch out and you can get distribution and a little bit of help organizing your concert so you can make a couple of bucks, you know, an upgrade from the bicycle to the Volvo or whatever, you know. But it just doesn't seem to be infrastructure now. That is, I guess, exciting. They're creating it right, right as we speak. Yeah, I mean, there's so many avenues now for an artist to put their music directly in the hands of an audience and, and eliminate the middleman. And, um, you know, a great website for that, I think I mentioned this on Abby's show, um, but I'm going to plug it again here, because any independent musician out there who is not familiar with the business end of things, um, and I don't blame them for not being familiar with it, because it's mostly completely BS, um, but the website bandcamp.com um is a great website for you you can upload your album your songs and you can directly monetize the 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 music you can even have it up there for free and have people pay whatever they want you know like donation based um and i think that's sort of where things are heading as far as what indie musicians yeah. No, that's great. That's actually great. One time at Bandcamp, that's actually great. I know a lot of people that are on it, my friends Wamu and others, so I like that. And so you guys can check it out. It's just Bandcamp. Pretty easy to find out there. Recordlabelrecords.org. That's your record label. Robbie Martin, are you signing people over there? Are you developing artists? What are you doing? Right now, I mean, because of what you just mentioned, I mean, I'm not going to repeat everything you just said because it was very on point, but the... The, you know, the business end of running a record label is very difficult. So with my record label right now, what I'm doing is I'm trying to lower my own manufacturing costs so I can be able to, um, you know, produce content um, on a regular basis. And um, believe it or not, uh, cassettes are actually kind of making a comeback right now. Um, and they seem to be a really good avenue for... <laughs> You know, not just my label, but other labels as well, to be able to manufacture, um, you know, like a professional looking and sounding cassette for, at a very, very low cost, um, per unit cost. So, that's kind of the direction wow. I'm in right now, um, actually. Good for you. And a lot of my friends still making records, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, no, vinyl records, I've, I put out, I think I just put out my 12th vinyl record on my label, but, you know, vinyl, vinyl record manufacturing is still pretty pricey, uh, unfortunately. Um, but there's also other avenues for that. Like if you want to release an ultra-limited edition, you can get one-offs made of, of vinyl records at certain places, you know, for $20 a pop, um, things like that. So there's, you know, if you're clever enough and you navigate around sort of this, this mass production, you know, corporate um, mass yeah. distribution 
paradigm, you can you can find ways to get your music out well, there. That's the exciting thing. Look, I've taken a lot of financial hits because the media has completely changed and how people are able to, you know, get a podcast or a, because now everybody can do a radio show. It kind of muddies the water a little bit. You know, everybody's in the garage and they know one chord on the guitar and now they're all rock stars. And it, you know, it makes it harder for guys like me who have been around for a long time, but I'm I'm willing to change with the time. So we've begun to get into and advance into new medias as well. I, I I'm not here to hold back progress or hold back uh, people speaking or whatever. So, but it is something new, and we are developing it. And you know, I think whatever we can realize is what we can do, Robbie. I think we should never hold back uh, to old paradigms. I completely agree. I mean, and now you know, now is this is this beautiful opportunity for anyone. You know, not just musicians, but, you know, people who want to get their political opinion out there, people who want to make independent films, um, to, to do things to get to, to reach an audience directly. I mean, you know, even if you're a filmmaker and you want to produce a movie, I mean, you have websites like Kickstarter now where you can make a trailer, you know, a, a short film of your film and get funding for the rest of it, yeah. you know, if it's something that's appealing enough to people out there. Trying to get my buddy to do that for his book, and he wants to write another book, but he's uh, broke, even though everybody read his last two books, he has no money. So, <laughs> I mean, there you go. Yeah. It's the that's, same thing. What I was going to say awesome. is that uh, also Bandcamp is awesome. My guitar player has a very cutting-edge website called Weed Share. Yeah, you guys will like that. Weed Share. <laughs> Dot com and it uses uh, the most brilliant cloud technology. He's way ahead of the pack on that, and uh, certainly I think he'd probably like it if that took off after the 10 years of development. That's where my band stuff is. That's why we're not on Bandcamp. All right, quickly, uh, Robbie Martin is with us. Robbie, you, you performed on Breaking the Set in your Freemason coat. You pretend to be a Freemason on Facebook. It freaks everyone out. Clear that up. And I loved how you talked about how you thought that the Boston Tea Party was a false flag, a Freemasonic false flag event. So, A, what is your affiliation with Freemasons? And, B, um, what, would, what was the story on that? Well, my affiliation with Freemasons is that I was shown a pretty hilarious Monty Python sketch maybe, I don't know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago now, of um, called the Architect Sketch. And... Uh, you know, any Python fans out there, any non-Python fans out there should at least look up this sketch because John Cleese is just, it's just a sketch where John Cleese breaks down while doing a job proposal interview and he just starts groveling to the people interviewing him saying, please let me become a Freemason. I want to be like you and have all your secret handshakes. And, um, I was, I had no idea who the Freemasons were at the time. So like, you know, my friend, uh, was kind of obsessed with them. He thought they were really funny. Um, and I started to read more about them, and I started to think they were pretty funny. You know, just I thought I was just a bunch of stuffy old men who would get together, wear these silly costumes and top hats, and you know, talk esoteria. Uh, you know, it, not letting their wives or, or their daughters come. But I mean, it turns out that the Freemasons actually have a very interesting history in terms of their involvement with the American Revolution. Big time. And well, I only have about. I just want to warn you. I only have about two minutes, so don't don't go too far. But go ahead. Yeah. I mean, basically, just for anybody out there listening, um, you know, the American Revolution, as idyllic and as, as nice as the story is, I mean, it involved a lot of subversion and deceptions by founding fathers and, and other various Freemasons. Um, you know, like, for example, Benjamin Franklin, um, who was a Freemason, used his newspaper outlets to exaggerate um, the British... Uh, soldier activity in the United States, like, you know, raping women, um, and burning storefronts and stuff. Throwing like that. babies out of incubators, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, I just find it interesting that a lot of people in the Patriot movement, you know, don't, they haven't really looked at the Freemasonic, uh, angle of the American Revolution. I mean, when you talk to Freemasons, they brag about the fact that they yeah. did the Boston Tea Party or that they were behind, um, you know the Paul Revere uh, infamous you know horse ride and all that stuff so they're they they're proud of it a lot of people say that they are themselves myth makers and that they trump up their own involvement in the revolution um so they're well, no of, we can look at the George Washington and his freemasonic apron and all the rest of it okay i mean that's 
look, it, 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 Franklin is a whole different can of worms, and I'd love to talk more about this. I am out of time, but a quadruple agent, in my opinion, part of the Hellfire Club, which was like the skull and bones of its day. I mean, they found dead bodies all over the place and <laughs> like torture rooms and stuff. And I want people to go back and read the Perfectibilists. And these are the actual papers of Adam Weisskopf and the Bavarian Illuminati. And what they say, and what I hear the modern-day patriots say, quote-unquote, in the new millennium, are almost identical. It's really scary, man. And that was a big slap in the face for me when I realized that, wow, am I been repeating Illuminati language for the last few years? I mean, I got to... I had to slap myself in the face for that. Great job today, Robbie. I really appreciate your patience with me and everything else. Anything you want to plug real quick before we go? i got about 10 seconds. Um, just uh, look up uh, fluorescent-gray.bandcamp.com. That's where you can grab my music and recordlabelrecords.org. Give Abby my best. We'll talk to you real soon, brother. All right. Have a great weekend. Spend time with your family. Be bold. Mighty forces will come to your aid. Bye. Thanks, Jack. Have a good one.